Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having uh, me here and us as in domestic data streamers. Uh, my name is Anne Guerra, and I am a journalist and the head of content of Domestic. We are a company, we are six years old, and we are based in Barcelona. Um, but we work worldwide doing something that it's not very easy to explain. In fact, my parents still don't really know what I do, which is very normal. Um, they still think that we do events, but yeah. Um, we are a communication consult consultancy studio, and we do um, data communication, info experiences, and data visualization. So that's mainly what we do, because we understood a long time ago that when you look for data on Google, what you get is basically this. It's green, it's blue, it's black, it's ones and zeros, and that's data and data and data. It's just very, very boring. So we understood that this was data. Okay, people think that data is all these ones and zeros. And then you get the actual, like, very, very technical description of what data is, which is like facts and statistics. Okay, collected together for reference or analysis. Again, this is very, very boring. We started thinking, and we were like, well, data is something a bit more than that. Data speaks about us. Data is stories. Data is numbers that show different realities, that show different stories of things happening in the world. Data can be about climate change. It can be about corruption. It can be about richness, about poorness, about very different realities in the world, hidden by numbers that usually are very, very big and we don't get to relate to. Because this was the first um, bar chart in the world, um, this one on this side. It was made first in the 18th century by William Playfair, and it, 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 said, um, it showed the data behind the Scotland's imports and exports. If we have a look at USA Today 2017, um, the prediction of peril in the USA is still shown in a very, very similar way. The data, the bar charts haven't changed. How can we talk about the exports and imports and the dangers in the USA in the same way that we did in the 18th century? It hasn't changed. If we show data like that, we can see that data tends to detach the emotions behind what they represent. We have the numbers and we have the reality, but we need the link. Because if we don't get that link, it shows that data can go to a lack of empathy. You don't understand what that means and it's very, very easy because it happens. It, you get the numbers about deaths in the Mediterranean, for example, and you don't really understand it because it's very difficult to understand and that's normal. So we got data, we got the reality, and we need that empathy in the middle because if we don't get that empathy, what happens is a lack of action. So if we don't get moved, we won't do anything. If we don't understand that data, we won't end up, we will end up scrolling and scrolling as we said before. This is data. This is um, exports and imports of countries, different um, objects and stuff that you can get from a different country like mining and petroleum and food and whatever. This is also data. And this might be the biggest news that you can get in your life. How can you get it that way, in such a cold way? Like this is also a way to represent a very, very important news that you can get. So things being this way, like, okay, we get the data, we get the form of visualizing it, and we get the feeling that there are emotions behind, but are emotions so important for data? They are, they very are. Because we get the truth and we get what you trust. This man here is Michael Cohen. He used to be um, Donald Trump's, one of the press officers of Donald Trump in the, in the run for election in 2016. Mr. Cohen said something very important once because during the election time and during the campaign, Donald Trump used to say on and on and on and on that the criminal records 
uh, all the criminal numbers in the USA had gone up with Obama. That wasn't true. That just wasn't true. The criminal records weren't going up. In fact, they were going down. But they sent the message on and on and on. And when he won the elections, this man, Mr. Cohen, went to the CNN. And uh, the journalists there were like, mate, you were lying. Like, th those numbers weren't true. Well, why did you say that? And Mr. Cohen said something very important. He was like, it doesn't matter what the data says. It's just what people want to believe. So that's what you get the, the click in all these matters. Those were how the numbers showed. This was what they said. So as this um, amazing cartoon says, uh, this explains very much how things work. It's like, I'm sorry, Ginny, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours so he gets the points. That's how it works nowadays. Today, when people go to, to the elections, and this was said uh, in 1946, Today, when people go to the elections, they don't get asked, what do you think, but what do you feel? And when people vote regarding what do they feel, because of that data being really far away from the emotions, well, that is a problem, because feelings are easily manipulated. This is another great example of how uh, the difference and that empathy is very needed between data and action and empathy. Gus Speth, uh, one of the climate scientists that started, you know, talking about um, how climate change was going to happen. He used to say, like, um, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual cultural transformation. And scientists, we don't know how to do that. Climate change alerts have been ringing for the past 50 years, and we don't seem to get it quite right yet. Um, this is an amazing action I would like to show to you. It's a little video. I hope we can hear it. Um, about some people that really, really got the good sense of data, climate change, and Donald Trump. Let's see if we can hear it. No. No sound. Well, sound is not working. That's a shame. Anyhow, um, this is a project made by um, a collective trying to um, tackle what Donald Trump was saying against climate change. And Donald Trump was saying, like, climate change, it doesn't, it, it doesn't exist. So, and Donald Trump was also saying that his face would be carved in Mount Rushmore with all the rest of the presidents there carved. So these guys um, decided to make an ice Donald Trump in the Arctic and see if it melted or not, just to show if climate change was working or not. So this is what they did. They went there, they climbed an iceberg, and this happened. That was the... The, the, their idea, how to show climate change was hoping or not, and feeling if people would vote for, like, it would melt or not in the end. Given all these um, situations that we're dealing with and doing what we do at Domestic Data Streamers, we try to do different projects with this approach. This, I would like to show you some projects that we've done lately, um, just to have a glimpse of um, what we do at Domestic. This is a project we've done with um, Oxfam, uh, the NGO, and um, Oxfam every year, in every country, they release an inequality report. They have these long reports about poverty and inequality in different countries, but they don't know how to show it to the people because it's all very technical, there are very n a lot of numbers, and it usually doesn't get through that easily. So they came to us and they were like, look, we want people to understand this, how inequality is one of the biggest problems that we have nowadays. It's not that our country is rich or poor. It's that it's very unequal. Like some people are really rich, some people are really poor. So we need to show that to the people. So we said, okay, we are gonna do two things. We're gonna do a website and we did a live data experience. The website was this kind and um, it would ask you different questions to 
show you how your privilege number was going down. So if you were born a woman, your privilege number would go down. If you were born in a poor area, your privilege number would go down. So that will show you that since you were born, you are born with less opportunities than other people, instantly. Um, and then we did a live data visualization in a cinema. We were showing that data, lighting up, as you can see there in the chart, where we did it technically, we were lighting up some rows to show people, like for example, them rows, that people, according to what Spain is doing right now, wouldn't be able to go to school, wouldn't be able to have a phone number, uh, wouldn't be able to get internet access just due to those inequality numbers. So we made it, we made people feel in their own bodies what that report would mean in their own lives and how other people are living. But we don't only do like very serious stuff, we sometimes also play a little bit with how things are made usually in the public sector. Um, the DGT, it's the Spanish um, traffic like system, like the ones who control the traffic and the ones that give you your driving license. So uh, it's like the National Bureau for Traffic and it usually looks a lot like this. It's very, very boring. So we thought we should change this a little bit uh, because mainly our boss, his name is Pau, and he was taking his driving license and he thought like the whole process of getting your driving license was horrible. It was boring, it was very, very badly done. So he started taking pictures of how it looked like. This is the examination room. And nobody understood what they had to do, where they had to go, um, if they had to go to the first floor, second floor, where. It all looked like this, and we went there one morning and we just took some pictures and saw what happens. This is what it looked like. Everybody was bored, nervous, using their phones, no idea what was going on there. So we did a, a pirate approach to service design. And we decided to hack the whole system, copying their own graphic and logos, and this is, I don't really think this is legal, but anyway. Um, we did these posters, explain to the people what would happen, uh, what it was going to, how the process was going to be like of getting their driving test. And we tried to make it fun because the misinformation is usually not fun at all. So we started putting these posters up saying like, okay, you're in the right place, yes. We identified that some people got very lost, so we helped them like go to the second floor. Uh, then we did some kind of stupid yeah, messages saying, hey, you're gonna pass, don't worry, it's, it's all gonna be fine. And people started smiling, something that didn't used to happen in those situations. So yeah, you're in the right spot, get your ID prepared, because nobody knew what they had to do. And you will be fine. Um, and if you're not fine and you don't pass, uh, well, self-driven cars will be here in like 50 years, so like no panic. We started posting um, little stickers saying he's gonna fail, he's not gonna fail, uh, relaxing techniques, she's gonna pass, he's gonna fail, she doesn't know what she's doing here, smile for the picture. This is like, do not press this, you will have to come back another day, like it's not gonna save you from anything. And if Justin Bieber has a driving license, you can have one too. This is very important to understand. So especially in that moment where you are like, I don't want to be here, I'm not going to pass, this is horrible. This kind of little data flashes that kind of connect with people and the information kind of gets to the people and it's a very good way to kind of ease up the whole tension there and twist the place because it changes completely. This is a, a poster that says, we know a woman that um, ran over her examiner during the practical exam, you're not going to do worse than that. And this is actually true. And then we did a little data visualization asking people like, what do you think it's gonna happen today if you're gonna pass or you're not gonna pass? So people started like um, cutting over little like pieces of paper saying, oh, I think, many people thought they were gonna pass. And this is the creator of all this, this is Power Boss. 65 days later, the poster was still there. So I think we didn't do that bad. 
And this is a completely whole different uh, project that we did three years ago already. This is made with UNICEF for the United Nations. Um, this is a very complex project because UNICEF came to us asking, okay, you do data and you do data visualizations and that's what you do and that's fantastic, but we want to show the data that doesn't exist. And we were like, okay, that's difficult. They were like, yes, because the United Nations were going to make um, one of their annual big reunions in, in New York. And UNICEF wanted to say to these heads of state of the whole world, like, look, there's many countries that don't collect any data about childhood. And if there's no data, there's no reality. Since there's no action, we don't do anything. There are many countries that don't collect any data about kids, so we don't know what happens with those kids. They just don't exist, they're invisible. And they want to, UNICEF was like, okay, we need main headquarters of the world, like main heads of state, uh, understand this reality and make them take action. And we were like, okay, that's a bit of a challenge, but we will take it. This was the place that like, you can imagine uh, how impressive this is when you need to do an installation there and the security measures that you can have there. I had a little video, but I won't be able to show it. This is what happened. Um, what we did is like, okay, we have this incredible situation that we don't know if it's gonna happen again. We are able to do an installation for UNICEF at the UN headquarters in New York. Let's have fun. So we built a time machine. And we were like, let's play, because with all these heads of state, Obama, Ban Ki-moon, people that had gone through everything in the world and they are used to read data the whole day. How are we going to connect with them? Like, how are we going to make them think, listen, and feel related to what we're saying? We were like, let's take it and let's make it very emotional. So we did a time machine, a time machine that would take those politicians back to their own childhood, make them connect to that childhood and uh, sign a commitment stating that they should think about child and kids first in every decision that they made in that gathering of the United Nations there. We had many problems doing that because it was, uh, the security measures were just incredible. The time machine, that black box there, didn't fit anywhere. So we had to disassemble it and assemble it again inside the UN headquarters. It was mad. And this is how it looked like. And with those commitments that the machine printed and the politicians needed to sign, we did an exhibition signed by every heads of state of the world, stating that they were going to think about kids first. At least that's what they said. That's um, how it looked like. So the time machine worked in a way that um, was very, very special. When the politician went inside the box, they had to close the door, it was um, soundproofed. And if you put your hand there, it would catch your heartbeat. Your heartbeat would be the base of a, of a song, like the beat. Ta the time machine um, would ask you questions and you would interact with it, with the screen. And depending on your answers, those questions were all about your childhood, like what do you wanted to be when you were a kid, how many friends you had. Depending on those answers, and how did you answer, how quick, it would add a new sound to that song. So at the end of the experience, you would have the song of your childhood. And you would go out with that song of your childhood. What happened was that, and the commitment, which was the machine asked you to make a little drawing that you used to do when you were a kid, and then it made you sign when you were a grown up. So it made you a commitment with your own childhood. How could you like, think about yourself, connect to that reality, and think about kids now? This is what the exhibition looked like. Ban Ki-moon was the one um, opening the machine. He didn't understand a word. Like That was like, what's going on here? And these guys were the usual guys that we got there. This kind of guys with the hair thing, then they, they all wanted to kill us. Because we had to put all the 
politicians inside that box. And they were like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. It did. And people from UNICEF were very happy. So the reality was that we created moments where heads of state from, there was this woman that was, she was in the government of um, Sierra Leone. And she came out of the machine crying because she was like, the sound of my childhood was horrible. It sounded really, really bad because she had gone through war and to situations that, you know, for us it was mental. So we, I think we did connect with politicians and with people that were really difficult to get to. So yeah, data, communication, things are changing and we still think about data in this kind of terms. Um, but what we do at Domestic is think that this is a way of representing data. This is data about literature. This is data about war. This is data about love. And this is data about fear. And this is a way to get to people that it's much easier to get to than numbers. The limits of my language means the limits of my word. We can only connect to people if you tell them something that they already know, if you make a similarity with something that they already know. And that is still a blank page that we need to explore. So that will be us at Domestic Industry. Grazie.